did you hear that smoking marijuana can stunt your growth? Now you tell me. Now you tell me. Might be too late for us. Yeah, I think we're we're, we're shrinking violets. Shrinking violets, never. Whoop, okay. Whoop, 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 whoop. Come up to cool. All right, all right, all Remember right. That? Settle Remember down, everybody. It's another show. It's another show. Another big day. Another bunch of bad behavior in capital markets and governments. Another day of, uh, well, call it borderline collapse of the global financial system at the hands of the world elite oligarchical. What do you call that? Bourgeois. No, I guess we're the bourgeois. Anyways, all kinds of bullshit coming up today, like. Earnings. We got a company that's actually made some money in the cannabis sector. We're going to have the guy here and we're going to be like, what? Bullshit. I call bullshit. Can't be. Can't, can't be. Can't be true. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the uh, chief uh, convicted felon in waiting, formerly, currently known as Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau as he continues to eviscerate his legitimate government and replace the, uh, now it's the justice minister slash attorney general and health minister have been replaced with basically students. And uh, this is in his all out effort to yeah. convey to the world how in tune he is with his electorate. Well, Poor Justin. It was fun while it lasted, wasn't it Justin? Wasn't it fun while it lasted? Oh my God, it was so fun. And here's the thing, if you just, had the brains to step back now, you might have a chance at rehabilitating your now utterly destroyed political future if you step out now. But if you continue to cling to the singing ship, sinking ship that is your government, you are going to be tossed onto the anonymity of history forever to be forgotten, except as a punchline of jokes. What a horrible end for what was such a bright and sunny start. Anyways, let's not dwell on the political. Let's this is not a political not, no. show. This is a cannabis show, and smoking cannabis has certain side effects. Among them are, you know, shorter attention span. Uh, what was maybe, your name again? Maybe, maybe smoking too much pot, Trudeau. No, he doesn't smoke pot. If he smoked pot, he'd be way more. He'd, if you were a pot smoker, there's no way you could pull that bullshit that he just tried to do, subjugating Canada's rule of law to corporate interests. That's the opposite. You think of someone what gave happened. him advice, though? It doesn't seem like he's, he's smart enough to... Well, but if you listen to the phone call between Michael Wernick and Jody uh, Rabel, Wilson Rabel, it's obvious that his technique is to deploy others, dispatch others to do the dirty work so that he can maintain his sunny disposition and selfie polished image for the public. Okay. Anyways... Let's not get caught up on Justin Trudeau. He's going to, uh, he will go to jail at some point. People with that kind of absence of uh, integrity always end up in the clink, don't they? You think so? Yeah. You know what's up big today? Planet Hollywood. No, Planet Hollywood. <laughs> what, what's the name of that? Guy? Planet 13. What is it? Planet 13. Yeah, Planet 13. And does smoking marijuana affect your short term memory? Or. I think it does. Yeah, Planet 13. They what? They're up 20%. Up 20% on the day. Do you know why? I guess they're doing really well. Well, it's uh, now two weeks away from their launch with the partnership with Mike Tyson's Tyson Ranch. Really? Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe they also had news. Who knows? Let's see. What's going on? What's going on? I don't know what's going on. What, I just what, got what? here. What? I just got here. Um, okay, so let's... Uh, Let's do ourselves a favor and go go say hello to the audience, because that's just what we do here. Okay. I think I'd be ready for that. And uh, who we got today? What do we have for entertainment? Um, well, we have um, a whole bunch of people here. Uh, oh, oh boy, what the hell is going on here? The can trust just broke below ten. Can trust broke below ten to the oh really? nine ninety nine. Nine ninety nine. Sounds like a blue plate. Sounds special. like the the upside down uh, over the shoulder boulder holder. The upside down Mephistopheles or whatever that that guy's called. Mephistopheles. Yeah, you know, the six 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 is uh, you know the symbol of the devil. No. Nine 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 is the upside down devil. Nine 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 is the upside down devil. Well, so that's the devil dangling by his toes. That sounds like sounds like fun. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Um, I don't know what's going on with my stupid YouTube here, but I can't seem to. Uh, oh, there we are. Okay, now we're gonna now we're gonna have audience conversation moments, assuming 
what the hell is going on with this internet? No, I don't want it to be full screen. You Weird. Okay, well, this is odd. Uh, so what's coming up today, Ed? You might want to know that uh, we're going to have uh, Keith Strack in here, president of Metafarm Labs, to talk about Metafarm's financials released today, in which they report over $2 million in EBITDA. That's right, over $2 million in EBITDA. Did I say that? Yes, I did. Uh, Damien Kettlewell will be here. He's the CEO of Blissco Cannabis. You might remember we had a somewhat aborted Skype conversation, thanks to, well, Skype. And uh, so he decided to come in for the real deal. And right. we decided that that's probably a good thing because, uh, you know, it's horrible to be left there. Then, of 340 Ed, you know what it's going to be? Chart analysis with James and Ed. Can you believe that? Rob Hill, CFO of Emerald Health Therapeutics, is going to be here uh, to tell us uh, about what's new with Emerald Health. Charles Turk joins us at 410 for an update on the nine point uh, special health care fund. Nine point, boy, I'm going to have to bone up on that before we get him in that chair. So, right. what, do you, what do you got for us, Ed? What's the big, so... Well, you know, the, 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 I, mentioned, I mentioned Plant 13. That, that's up 20% today. Yes. Uh, continuing in its upward ascent today is uh, Charlotte's Web, up another $2.50. Really? $2.30. Really? Yeah, there's been some, some good action. The, uh, the, the, the S&P is up again, and it's getting all, you know, not, not far away now from the all-time high registered in October. Uh, you know, gold sort of nobody seems to give a shit. Well, you know, I give a shit. Well, you've got gold. You you own. You're a gold. Well, I can't say you're a shareholder. You're gold an ounce is holder. the standard by which all currencies throughout history have ultimately been measured. All yeah. the currencies that it has served as a measure for are now defunct, except the U.S. dollar. Although well, one could argue that that's pretty much inviolable if not defunct. And uh, the U.K. pound. So uh, yeah, what's really going to happen in the U.K.? What do you think? You think we're going to have a Brexit? I'm gonna I'm gonna have a muffin for Brexit tomorrow. Muffin and a bowl wakey, of fruit. Wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. Muffin and fruit. Uh, no, I don't know Brexit. So yeah, I don't know. That whole situation looks like a bunch of passive aggressive mud wrestlers getting into a pit and smoking too much weed, and there's the result. Okay, let's leave. No, let's no, no, stay. Please stay. No, we're going. We're going. We must go. No, we must stay. Like. Holy fucking Jesus, I don't know, that's insanity. Yeah. yeah. I want to say hello to Ivan Black, I want to say hello to Faye Smith, I want to say hi to Mary Kemp, Jay Hilton, Michael Correa, uh, Jelly Beans 37421 wants to know what's going up on with Body and Mind, up 14% today. Well, we'll take a look at that at some point in the show here. Uh, Joe Briscoe gives us a wave. Hello, Joe. Travis R. Hello, guys. Carl Bowden. Hello, Carl. Uh, no snark today. All right. Uh, let's see. There's Larry Lamo. Hi, Larry. Um, so anyways, we're going to listen to the now very much recuperated news nurse Ricky Gerwitz with the news. Here are the headlines moving markets today. Chiron Life Sciences Corp. has signed multi-channel distribution agreements for its Quita cosmeceutical brand with Fedco and Lineo, two of the most prominent consumer distribution channels for wellness and beauty products in Colombia. In combination with the initial product launch through Pharmatoto and Pharmalisto, it is anticipated that the Quita brand will now be made available in up to 78 retail locations and through the company's leading online portal for beauty products. Initially focused on distribution in Colombia, these agreements create potential for the company to further expand distribution across Latin American jurisdictions. Aurora Cannabis Inc. has filed a preliminary short-form base shelf prospectus with the securities regulators in each province of Canada except for the province of Quebec. Aurora also signed a corresponding shelf registration statement on Form F10 with the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. The shelf prospectus and registration statement will allow the company to make offerings of common shares, debt securities, subscription receipts, units, warrants, or any combination thereof of up to $750 million US during the 25-month period that the shelf prospectus is effective. Medifarm Labs reported losses of $8.46 million as the company provided its fourth quarter and full year financial results for the year ending on December 31, 2018. 
Medifarm also reported a Q4 2018 revenue of $10.2 million commencing on November 12th after receipt of sales license from Health Canada and an adjusted EBITDA of $2.1 million. During the quarter, Medifarm became the first fully licensed producer to specialize solely in cannabis extraction and also signed a large private label cannabis oil sale agreement with Canopy Growth Corp for the sale of up to 900 kilograms over 18 months. Organigram Holdings Inc. announced the release of a cross-platform patient-focused mobile application. The application was designed to offer patients greater convenience in optimizing their medication regimen and staying up to date on products, programs, and company news. Through this new application, registered patients are able to order medical cannabis products and accessories, manage their patient profile, view past orders and order limits, read the latest organogram news and press releases, and communicate with client care representatives. Planet 13 Holdings Inc. announced monthly statistics for the Planet 13 Las Vegas Cannabis Entertainment Complex since opening on November 1st, 2018. Since the opening on November 1st, revenue has grown 63.4%, a 13.1% compound monthly rate. Phase 2 expansion is expected to be complete by Q3 2019. In March, the complex had 1,987 paying customers per day at an average ticket price of $89.17. Emerald Health Therapeutics Inc. signed a letter of intent to supply cannabis to the SQDC, Quebec's sole legal distributor of recreational cannabis. Under the agreement, Emerald will supply cannabis to the SQDC from its Quebec-based St. Eustache facility, Verdelite, as well as from its 50% owned joint venture, Pure Sun Farms, in Delta, BC. Emerald will fulfill its first supply order in Q2 2019. High Tide Inc. announced that its common shares have been upgraded by the OTC Market Group for trading on the OTCQB market under the stock symbol HTDEF. Liberty Health Sciences Inc. announced today that it will open its 13th Florida dispensary. The company also received approval from the Florida Department of Health for an additional use of 80,000 square feet of enclosed greenhouse space at their Gainesville campus. Weekend Unlimited Inc. has begun to distribute its can of candies mixed fruit gummies in the northeast corner of the U.S. after shipping its first order of the hemp oil infused candies. The sale of the can of candies on the eastern seaboard will be followed by the product's launch in the Midwest and the Southeast. And that's your news for today. Planet 13 had news. Yeah. The revenue's up. We don't know how much, though, because there's no mention of uh, how much. What's the revenue number? If anybody could look that up for me in the production world outside of this stage environment, please let us know what was Planet 13's number. That's the most important number that's not in this press item. Thank you. Uh, Weekend Unlimited started selling gummy candies. This whole candy, CBD, gummies, candy thing, yeah. like, it's like giving candy to a baby. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah. Like stealing candy from a baby? Like, is that supposed to be easy? No. That implies something's not right in the universe. Yeah, I had, a, I had a little bit of a chocolate bar the other night. Did you? Was it, uh, did it have any Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol in it? It had something in it because I can assure you, when I eat a normal chocolate bar, not too much happens. No? When I eat one of these chocolate bars, a lot happens. Yeah? <laughs> did yeah, you clean the house? Did you do your laundry? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, it, it, yeah. Didn't do my laundry. No? But, uh, Who does no. your laundry? I do. Do you? Yeah, I do my own laundry. I wouldn't let anybody do my laundry. You wouldn't let anybody uh, mess with your dirty shorts? Well, <laughs> they're, they're, they're clean. Yes, but they're not allowed to do they're, your laundry. They're not allowed to do. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Ah! Yeah. yeah. I'm a sort of an independent kind of guy, you know? Mm. Yeah. Um, the independent, like a newspaper, right? Independent. Independent. In <laughs> independent. Depends. It depends. Depends on what you know. Depends on who you know, not what you know. Um, I wanted to uh, point, I want to draw attention of the, uh, the gathered crowd here. All 128 of us on YouTube, all 355 of us elsewhere. And draw your attention to JWC, uh, James E. Waters Wagner. Cultivation Corporation. Wagner, James, <laughs> get it right, Wes. 
James E. Wagner Cultivation Corporation. Um, one of our team was out at the uh, facility yesterday and uh, these guys are growing with an aeroponic system called Grow Storm that is going to take the growing world by, by storm. storm. And I'm not I kidding. That. This thing turns out 45 kilograms per growing section and I don't have the exact cubic footage on that or anything that would put that in any kind of context for anybody but here's the thing. When I first met Nathan Woodward, I think it was two years ago now, he said to me, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create this aeroponic system that's going to be proprietary. I'm going to grow all these things in these potted out rooms right. to eliminate, you know, the risk of whole crop failure. And I'm going to grow plants that yield 45 kilograms per each of these growing pods. And so here it is two years later, fast forward, our guys go out there and he says, you won't believe it, they're growing 45 kilograms per, and I'm just like, well that's just amazing. That's exactly what he said he was going to go do two years ago and now he's done it. And, and did, he, did he know how to do it back then? Well, he certainly had an idea, but uh, yeah, you know, so they've been evolving this, this aeroponic system. Like, so they're the only guys out there that grow aeroponically. They perfected various aspects of aeroponic growing, which was, as you might know, was originated at, uh, by NASA. And uh, now they've got proprietary intellectual property around it. But this stuff, like we were looking at plants that were like two months old and the stalks on them were like that, two months old. And it's just the most- They're growing fast. They're growing fast. They look so healthy. It like, it's like if you just- Where are they getting the nutrition from? Where plants? They, yeah. From the dirt? So the difference between no aeroponic dirt. and hydroponic, exactly. There's no, so, there's no medium. So the roots are suspended in the air and the air is misted or the roots are kept moist by any combination or <laughs> I've heard that they've got a different system called fogging, but the, the aeroponic systems that I've seen, basically they drip water onto, directly onto the root mass, which is suspended beneath the plant from a small pail. So the thing is basically, it's just roots and plant, it's no dirt, which gives them the ability, gives the roots maximum uptake as while it gives the plant. Uptake from where? Uptake from the nutrients in the uh, water that it's being fed. So this is, so the nutrition comes from water. Well, that's the nutrition is suspended in water. Right, okay. So there's, there's some stuff in the water. Yeah, the food. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a little marijuana is in there, eh? Get a little... Uh, no. <laughs> well. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It, it, you know, just, is, is that, that going to be the way all food is grown in the future? Yeah, I think that uh, aeroponics is, going, is the way of the future. It's the way of the future. It's the way of the future. Uh, anyway, so coming up right now, we're going to talk to Keith Strachan, the president of Metafarm Labs Corp. But here's a little taste of what's to come. in 2015, Medifarm Labs produces pharmaceutical grade cannabis oil using downstream secondary extraction methodology, distillation and cannabinoid isolation and purification. Medifarm Labs provides B2B contract processing of cannabis to Canadian authorized licensed producers and international growers, supplying cannabis oil to qualified companies for sale under their own brand. In addition, Medifarm Labs will supply raw materials formulations, processing, and packaging for the creation of ready-to-sell advanced derivative products. Through its subsidiary, Medifarm Labs Australia PTY Limited, Medifarm has also completed its application process with the Federal Office of Drug Control to extract and import medical cannabis products in Australia. Medifarm Labs is listed on the TSX Venture and trades under the ticker symbol LABS. I'm joined now by Keith Strachan. He's the president of Metafarm Labs Corp. Keith, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's yeah. Uh, exciting to be on the show. Congratulations on your quarter, or oh. on your, yeah, that's amazing. 10.2 2 million with adjusted EBITDA of 2.1 million in Q4. No small feat. We have an amazing team there in Bay Area, and that's a, that's a lot of oil that we got put out there in the month of December. Okay, so how much oil does that represent? 
Uh, we can't give exact volumes just to protect some commercial terms of some of our agreements where we are a little bit bound. But oh. um, you know, if you if you take a look at it at a whole, as far as the the revenue goes and kind of what you see uh, retail value wise and what's going out, that could be you know anywhere between let's call it 75 to 125 uh, kilograms of crude resin. So uh, most of that was wholesale, uh, majority of it in um, the form of like winterized oil, which would then go on by one of our purchasers to be an end product, such as uh, a gel capsule or um, sublingual drop. Hmm. So you guys are producing concentrated extracted cannabinoids. Yes. And you have a partnership with Canopy. Yes. Is that who you're, and, you, and Supreme? Yeah, we have multiple partnerships. Uh, those two are very different ones. So with our friends at Canopy, we actually buy wholesale flour from all across Canada, uh, buying from over 15 different licensed producers right now. Uh, we make that into an oil concentrate and then we sell that to Canopy. So we're not actually repurposing some of their dry cannabis. We're actually uh, giving them an opportunity to increase their inventory, hmm. which is uh, very unique to something that we do. In the case of Supreme and, uh, and Seven Acres, great company, what we do for them is we actually take their uh, dry cannabis uh, and make it into an oil product, uh, put it into a bottle formulated with their label on it, and then we'll ship that directly to a provincial re retailer on their behalf. Okay. So how do we compare what you guys do with what, say, for example, Valens Grow does, who also has these types of partnerships? I mean, the investing audience wants to know, is it a case of one is better than the other? Is it a case of one does things differently than the other and both are at the top of their game? Is it a case of you let the best man win and we can argue about that all day long. <laughs> no, I would say, uh, you know, both great companies. We, we think that we're very differentiated in a number of ways. Uh, the, one of them is our private label model where we are buying wholesale cannabis. So we're putting our neck out, buying that supply, having a supply chain downstream where we're bringing in dry cannabis from 15 different suppliers and then we're selling that wholesale. And what that really gives us an opportunity to do going forward is work with uh, private label deals where let's say a consumer packaged good brand in a different vertical wanted to come into cannabis, we can give them a whole turnkey solution, including the supply chain. So whereas we see other uh, people getting into the extraction space are a lot focused on more of the tolling model, so take a producer's dry flour, turn it into something else, send it back to them, that's more of a fee for service. And what we're doing is something that's fully turnkey, and I think that that's really going to empower some big brands that we know from other verticals and help them enter into the cannabis space. Mm -hmm. So. Just as by way of example, I use a um, I use a CBD uh, sublingual oil every day, Great. olive oil and yeah. ninety eight percent CBD oil. Yeah. Um, and so, do you guys make that for? No. Yes. Yes. So we totally turnkey that oil. So that sublingual drop. Uh, we make those now so we can do um, a private label for someone who's not involved with cannabis so they never have to touch it. We just put their logo on it and send it out to a provincial retailer or we can do it for another licensed producer. So in the case like I mentioned with uh, Supreme Seven Acres, what, the, what that is is a full turnkey solution where we will use their unique formula. So it stays unique to them, not for any other customer, uh, very great formula. And then we bottle into a bottle, package it, excise sticker out to the provincial distribution. Distribu mm. Right. So if I have a proprietary process, yes. I share it with you, you do the processing and uh, and it's it's protected by agreement. Yeah, protected by agreement and that's the great thing about Medifarm Labs not having a brand. So we're never competing with our customers. So hmm. uh, when you bring in a proprietary formulation, although we may love it, we keep it just for you because we don't actually have a, a way to mobilize it just for ourselves. And right. that's not our business model. Our business model is strictly to empower other brands. That's really interesting. So strict, strict, and we're talking strict, strict B2B. Strict is the key to positive EBITDA. And I, right. think, that's, well, I think that being singular focused on extraction yeah. and uh, really hunkering down on our business model and staying laser focused is what gave us opportunity to come out of the gates and uh, frankly surprise a lot of people in this industry with uh, that profitable yeah. quarter. We're not used to cannabis companies <laughs> with profits. Yeah. Um, okay, so then what's the uh, what's the next step? Are you guys able to project uh, what the year's going to rest of the year's going to look like in 2019? Yeah, I think um, got, uh, financial guidance wise is some, something we're ready for today. But um, you know, projecting out, I think we talked about the white label uh, solutions, private labels, so empowering some big brands, whether that's from 
natural health food or from CPG, bringing them into cannabis. I think that there's a huge opportunity there. You'll see a lot of those announcements made over the next uh, quarter as far as who we are going to be working with in those spaces. And I think there'll be some names that everyone recognizes. So we're really excited about that. And then we're also looking at the science side. So where we were the first person to do extraction only, uh, we're not hanging our hats just on that. We want to remain a leader. And what we're doing is we're working on the science side to uh, do things like isolate and fractionate uh, novel, smaller cannabinoids and things like that. And really commercialize some of those activities from outside the lab to actually getting products on the shelf. So mm -hmm. lots of good things coming up in 2019. And, and uh, obviously um, sticking with our laser focus to make sure that we are uh, remain uh, positive on our EBITDA. Right. I was uh, I was present at a uh, at a we'll call it a discourse where a guy held up a I think it was uh, what did he say I can't remember it was like uh, I don't know like a ten liter jug of uh, extracted concentrate. Oh yeah. And yeah. he said this is worth sixty seven thousand dollars. And the other guy said, yeah, in Canada, in the U.S., it's only worth 100 <laughs> So which it's my sort of long-winded way of leading into the conversation about commodity pricing for the raw material. Obviously, if you're buying the raw material, that's yeah. your input. Yeah. Commodity pricing is welcome. But now what happens when you're not capturing the only remaining margin left, which is in the retail pricing, because you've got to sell to a wholesaler who's now going to say to you, we're right, I want cheaper oil because uh, otherwise I go yeah, elsewhere. because your prices are coming down. So we are seeing a bit of co price compression on the dry cannabis side. I think in the kind of bulk formulated, as you mentioned, or bulk uh, concentrate, we will see a little bit of price compression. And I think that's why it's important that um, Medifarm moves forward in a way that we are actually making end products. So where we're working with these partners of private labels, um, they don't they're not from cannabis, they're coming into cannabis, we're giving them a turnkey solution. I think because we're bringing so much value to the table, uh, it's not an actual kind of pure CMO, co contract manufacturer relationship that you see in other industries. Mm -hmm. It's more of a partnership. So whereas we're bringing our regulatory expertise, our formulation expertise, and that um, secure supply chain, that's where we really get to realize a lot of that revenue on where you said is on that end product. And I think with specialized end products, especially in healthcare and kind of like pharmaceutical type products, uh, we don't see that price compression. Sure. The imminent uh, legislation in Canada for edibles and beverages, yes. which we're expecting in October, theoretically this year, yeah. is that a huge value catalyst for you guys? Massive. So right. like that for us, we make uh, distillate now. So when you see like a vape pen that's so popular in other jurisdictions, uh, we make that distillate now. So as soon as we get the Health Canada regulations, we'll be filling vape cartridges and we'll be getting our partners brands on the shelves with things like vape pens. I think we're going to see some big um, consumer packaged goods si uh, companies come in from the edible side and from the drink side. And what we want to do is work with those big companies. So rather than launch a Medifarm water Water, which um, you know with the restrictions on marketing we don't see a big brand awareness opportunity there we want to work with someone who maybe sells water already on the shelves that you know and then give them either the CBD or THC inputs to empower that brand mm -hmm. very it's cool really big opportunity yeah yeah um, so in terms of uh, the supply of cannabis I mean, it sounds to me like the advent of edibles and beverages and vape cartridges yeah. and all that in October could actually cause the entire supply chain to be under pressure again, whereas currently, you know, it's it, to me it's always interesting. I hear from an extractor yeah. like Metafarm that you're able to buy all you need of uh, dry flour from existing producers, yet yeah. on the retail side we hear that there's this huge shortage yeah. of, uh, of material. And so it's, it's very hard to reconcile those differences from, you know, from this watching the center, it's like being at a tennis game and there's like five <laughs> tennis players playing with eight balls and you're just like, okay, what is really going on here? Uh, yeah, I think what's important to note is, uh, well, we can always use more cannabis, but we're not seeing a big supply shortage at this point. I think we did a press release earlier this week. We bought 5,000 kilograms of cannabis just in the last three or four weeks. Premium uh, dried flour. And, yeah, brought that into us. So maybe not always premium. So that's kind of where what we're that going cost with you? that. So uh, cost varies a lot by partner. Not all cannabis is created equal. So we might be buying 10% uh, THC trim or we might be buying 20% uh, 
uh, CBD or THC flower. So really that difference obviously causes a difference in price. So the, the, it ranges a lot as far as like whether we're buying it for $3 a gram or $4 a gram as far as what the price of the input is. And I think what there's a big opportunity out there right now is as all these um, you know great Canadian cultivators scale up and bring on these greenhouses, we're seeing a lot of extract ready cannabis. So where it might be your first or second test crop or you're growing at large scale, uh, that might not be the perfect bud that you want to put on the shelf and put your name on it, but it's perfect for extraction. Okay. So then we bring in stuff like that. So we're not seeing a big supply shortage. I think the other shortage that we're seeing is the kind of expertise in the final mile. So whereas a lot of companies have uh, focused on growing great cannabis and doing that, I think uh, the regulations came quickly and you know getting it from uh, the plant to the store is a whole other level of expertise. We're seeing a lot of maturity in the market now, but there's still a long ways for us as a whole industry to go. So mm -hmm. that's what we bring to the table is um, our expertise of actually getting the product to the shelf. Sure. In uh, the United States, they're restricted to uh, putting only CBD derived from hemp, right. which is by definition uh, a cannabis plant yes. that has below 0.3% THC content, yeah. but does it also max out at 3% CBD? Uh, I think in the United States, and I'm not a professional on, the, on that jurisdiction, but uh, there is some cultivators in places like Kentucky, Colorado, who are growing high CBD ah. hemp. Okay. Uh, in Canada, we're not seeing those genetics now. So high where CBD we're, meaning what percentage? Uh, higher than, let's say, 8% okay. uh, cannabinoids by weight. What's so, the highest CBD feedstock you've encountered? CBD feedstock from hemp in Canada, I haven't seen a certificate of analysis of anything over 5%. Okay. So that's not something that we'd look to process. Right. So is, and to, to what extent does the percentage of contained CBD at the plant feedstock level affect the economics of the concentrates that you're you're producing it's huge so basically we're doing let's call it like an 80 to 90 percent recovery on those cannabinoids or let's on this case CBD so if we're putting in five percent uh, and then we're only like five percent uh, 100 kilograms, we're only getting four to five kilograms of actual concentrate oil. If we put in 20% uh, THC, we're getting 20 kilograms. So obviously there's a huge economies of scale opportunity there with the more potent plant. Mm -hmm. And so we've tried to stay away from some of that low CBD hemp. And because we, we have a pharmaceutical facility, as you saw kind of in the intro video there, we operate in ISO rated clean rooms, very professional chemist and pharma team. So um, it really, we focus on those high value products and right now uh, we're just not seeing that in hemp in Canada. Cool. Um, well it's an amazing story. I really, I, I am really blown away at how fast you guys came out of nowhere and become this uh, you know profitable company. Uh, congratulations again Keith and we're gonna leave it there for now. I'll have you back soon. Thanks for Great. joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Good seeing you. You bet. All right let's take a look at some big news coming down the cannabis in the cannabis industry pipe. Here's some financials that we can expect in the next few weeks. Green Thumb Industries are releasing their fourth quarter and full year 2018 financial results on April 9th after market close with a conference call at 5 p.m. with investors. Afria are releasing their Q3 financials on April 15th with a conference call at 9 o'clock a.m. Delta 9 are releasing their Q4 financials on April 23rd. And TerraSend are releasing their Q4 financials on April 30th. Who's your partner? Here we are, here we are, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Um, yeah, Metafarm, Ed, is that one that you would have picked as your top pick because you saw this, uh, this, this clearly disciplined path of execution leading to... Let's, let's, let's take a look at the... Uh, what's the symbol? What's the symbol? How can you ask me that? The well, symbol is, well, labs. L-A-B-S. Oh, if I If you thought, notice I, in our I chat thought, room, people have been... Every time we mention Valens Grow, people are all up and like, what about labs? Labs is the better play. You got to look at labs. Stop talking about Valens Grow. Go look at labs. So, interesting, differentiated model leading to early EBITDA in the uh, evolution of the company. Wow. I know. Look at that top. That, Fascinating. That, this thing has had a nice little uh, bounce up to almost $4, currently yeah. 360 So how many shares out? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. 
Well, I can, I can ask that. I can tell you. Yeah, you can tell me. I, I know how to do that. Dime, dime como ellos dicen on español. Español. That's horrible, español. Um, I'm going to Peru this weekend. And there, will you be perusing in Peru? I'll be perusing. Yes, I will be perusing. I'm going to peruse some of the finest cuisine that Peru has to offer. So I'm going to go to Rafael. I'm going to go to Central. I'm going to go to Astrid y Gaston. And what's the fourth one? I can't remember. Anyways, I got my restaurant dance card absolutely chock-a-block. Uh, but we're also going to go visit some, uh, some of the areas in Peru, which uh, it's funny. So there's now a land rush going on in Peru. In fact, every promoter who's ever made a dime off of any cannabis story is now focused on Peru. They'll tell you they're not, but they, they are. So Peru is a very interesting place to do business. Um, and it's a, it's a cultural thing. You know, it's... Uh, and the food's unbelievable. The food is unbelievable, yes. The Pisco, well, you know what, a, you, have you ever tried the Pisco uh, Sour? The Pisco is the, uh, their, their national drink, isn't it? Pisco is the national drink. It's kind of like grappa, cross between grappa and brandy. But a Pisco Sour is basically a whiskey sour made with Pisco. And apparently, can't remember the gentleman's name, was visiting from London. He was in the Hotel Mori, downtown Lima. And he asked the bartender to make a whiskey sour. And the bartender said, we don't have whiskeys. He said, what do you got? He said, bartender said, Pisco. He said, okay, let's try a Pisco Sour. And that's how the Pisco Sour was born. And so one of the places that I'm going to take our amigo over there is the Bar Mori, where the first Pisco Sour was actually made. And Pisco Sour is a very interesting drink because they're kind of like breasts uh, in that one is not enough, two is perfect, and three is too many. Notice I did that without one bit of sexism in there. I know. How about that, eh? Now, who, who are you taking down there? Who am I taking down there? Yeah. I'm taking, well, I'm not taking anybody, but I'm going down with our illustrious uh, silent banking partner. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Down, down to uh, Peru. Mr. X, we'll call him. Mr. X, okay. Mr. X is coming with me to Peru, yes. Well, that'll be nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Okay. So we're going down there to get the lay of the land and to see who's really going to win the cannabis race down there. Um, I, you know, I lived in Peru for two years, so I... I it's a Did you actually live there for two years? Yeah. Or you just tell everybody that? No, I used to live there for two years. I had a... No, we lived there for two years. Um, moved back in May 2011. You like it down there? Uh, I love Peru. I love Peru. I love the food. I love the culture. I love the countryside. Like, I mean, Peru's got like every climate imaginable. Microclimates. Well, they're, well, yes, microclimates. They got jungle. They got yeah. alpine. They've got yeah. desert. They've got Sierra. Yeah, they've that's got one of the reasons forest. why they say the cuisine's so great because these different climates yeah. allow different types of food. Well, the things do grow amazing down there. Yeah. Like, uh, and it's amazing. So, like, mangoes growing at like 7,000 feet. It's like, wait a sec, what are mangoes doing growing at? I mean, that's how weird it is. Really? It's re yeah, it's really, it's really, they call Machu Picchu hey, a power you, place on earth. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting, but you certainly get the sense, especially after consuming cannabis, that there is a convergence of s sorts of the uh, energies of the planet going on in Peru, especially yeah. at Machu Picchu. But okay. yeah. Sorry, what? They're speak. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Um, okay, so uh, I think we answered that question. William Baz Jones from amongst the audience said, when is labs? <laughs> but Been labs there, are done when that. you have a, a Labrador retriever and you got more than one of them, then you have some labs. Dan says, hi, James. Hi, Ed. Hi, Dan. Don't know which Dan you are. Dan it. Dan the man. Dan it. Dan it all to hell. Uh, let's see. So, um, what are we doing? Let's see. Uh, is my wife from Peru? I don't have a wife. And no, he's not from Peru. There. I'm out. Spilled the beans. Uh, Ivan Black. Sad to see what happened to MedMen. Soon businesses will be expected to make money. Good one, Ivan Black. I love yeah, well, it. Yeah, well, there's an article that was floating around. Yes. Talking about how MedMen was running out of cash. Is that right? Yeah, but they secured some credit. You know, the thing about the universe is 
It likes to smack down the cocky motherfuckers who think they can just call the shots as it is and get their way the whole time. Yeah. It's a way of, it's how humility and, uh, you know, modesty are inculcated in the human species. The universe says, oh, really? You think you're going to be that kind of big swinging hee-haw? Well, no, you're not. Well, psh, take that. Yeah. Um, we have uh, another guest waiting in the wings, and uh, his name is Damien Kettlewell. He's the CEO of Blissco, and he's going to join us in just one second. But first, sample this little tidbit. Blissco Cannabis Corp. is a Canadian wellness cannabis brand based in British Columbia and a multi-licensed cultivator, processor, and distributor of premium cannabis. Blisco owns and operates an 18,000 square foot state-of-the-art GPP facility located in Vancouver, British Columbia with extraction, cultivation, and processing rooms. With a license to process cannabis oil acquired in August of 2018, Blisco's extraction lab is also in operation preparing a line of full-spectrum oils for distribution in 2019. Blisco Cannabis Corp. is listed on the CSE under the ticker symbol B-L-I-S. We will sales license. We will have our sales Welcome license. Welcome back. I'm here with Damien Kenwell. He's the CEO of Blisco Cannabis. And Damien, you've brought some samples with we you. We have brought some samples, James. Okay. Yes, indeed. So now you've got products on the, on the shelves in the Ontario Cannabis Store and elsewhere. Uh, BC Cannabis Store as of Monday and Tuesday. Uh, exciting uh, time, the evolution of Blisco. We have uh, pre-rolls, uh, pre-rolls, three pre-rolls. What's that? That is the next generation pre-roll. So that's oh. an exciting one, James, because that's that, good to say. It looks exciting. <laughs> <laughs> that is for an, uh, that's pulled from the ocean and it's ocean oh. waste. So you know, there's really? big blobs of plastic oh, floating you mean out the there. The casing is the casing is waste ocean waste plastic pulled out of the ocean. Wow, so, uh, that's impressive. Yeah, I know. We've worked hard so to this source is it. Recycled product. That is recycled product, and then uh, this, which is it, the. Uh, the BC shelves, um, and soon to be Alberta and New Brunswick and Saskatchewan. Uh, this is about for recycled uh, milk jugs, the, the bottom uh, half of it here. So really? that's uh, it's quite exciting. Th this one actually is not. We had our first order is the, the standard, but we do have 50,000 uh, in our uh, facility now that are going to be packaged. So it's uh, pretty uh, pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah, we're excited. No, we are excited. So, you, so with these, is this your entire product suite that you brought basically the packaging I just for? brought some goodies. Sorry yeah, right. that, that they're empty. Uh, here. So that's that's the oh this this pouch too is um, compostable uh, paper. Okay. So you got to take the labels off, and yeah. then the, the bags will be compostable, and so the pre-rolled tubes go inside. So inside here is a pre-rolled tube. Right. You've so. been selling loose cannabis on the Canadian or the Ontario cannabis store for a while now, haven't you? Uh, not at this point. No. Oh. We're, so we we just got uh, our first. Uh, so we're from Vancouver, BC. We're right. a cannabis uh, wellness brand for Vancouver, BC. Uh, and since uh, uh, we was last in studio, things have really evolved for the company. So. Um, uh, you know, we've basically got our we got our sales we got our oil production license in uh, in November so we've we've got three SKUs of uh, oil the the droppers that are coming out a high CBD and a balanced uh, two two to one CBD THC and then a CB and a THC uh, oil as well uh, and that'll be coming out in the summertime but uh, we got our uh, so we got our oil uh, so we got our, our dried flower sales license in November and so that enables us enables us to sell uh, dried flour uh, three and a half seven gram containers or uh, uh, pre-rolls and so that's uh, that's our initial offering and really the the future for Blisco is uh, is the oils uh, we uh, currently have uh, we can put out a few hundred thousand of these a year uh, but with the expansion plans we have we'll be putting out over 10 million of these a year 30 milligram uh, containers of uh, vessels of oil uh, and this as well is uh, glass so it's recyclable the glass so that oh, uh, cool. fits in with our our, uh, our focus of being, we're really a, a whole, uh, real focus on the full spectrum, so whole flower, whole you. As you know, there's over 60 cannabinoids right. in, the, in the cannabis plant, and so we want our, our customers and our patients to be able to use all of those, be able to receive all the medical benefits of all of those cannabinoids, so uh, we're really focused on the full spectrum. So Interesting. Yeah. Um, on that point, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't tell you how many times that somebody mentions the number of CBDs, yeah. and the number invariably ranges from, I think 60 is the lowest I've heard, up to 140. Up, yeah, yeah. I mean, the science continues to evolve, but I just kind of be safe and okay. say above 60. The 60 you yeah, know about. 60, uh, right. yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a CBDA, and there's, you know, there's, 
CBD, there's just, you know, a whole multitude of, uh, of them. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are uh, moving down uh, on some research fronts. Uh, we did present about a month ago in Toronto at the Sick Kids Institute, Research Institute in Toronto. Uh, it was quite exciting. There was uh, pediatric researchers from across Canada uh, with uh, doctors, and they were looking to, uh, it was basically organized by uh, industries, uh, by a nonprofit called MyCERN, and they wanted to ensure that when there is a clinical trial on uh, pediatric research in, in regards to cannabinoids, that it's really focused, uh, because we are a you know wide uh, geographic country with uh, a limited amount of sick kids, and so really they're trying to focus on a clinical trial uh, for cannabinoids that'll work for, for pe pediatric researchers. And as you probably heard in Israel, uh, there's pediatric research that's being done on autism, and some early early results show that autism, the use of cannabinoids, can help uh, children with their autism. And so, yeah. uh, the uh, we're helping uh, just uh, with some introductions, and we're going to participate uh, in, uh, in the in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the future in in uh, trials like that and other trials as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, Blisco is uh, it's really been quite a journey, and mm -hmm. uh, we are now at the stage where we have revenue. So after five and a half years, we have accounts receivable, where uh, and uh, it's only going to grow, so it's a sure. really exciting times. So. Okay, so what's your uh, what's your cultivation footprint look like? So we are a processor first and foremost. Okay. Uh, so uh, so you buy your inputs from others. That's right. We have two uh, supply agreements. Uh, number one from uh, Supreme Cannabis Company, which is a minority shareholder in Blisco. We're fortunate to have them as a minority strategic investor. And then we have a, a supply agreement for up to three thousand kilos of uh, of cannabis for the medical market uh, over the next two years. Hmm. And as well, we're fortunate to be working with uh, Green. Seal Cannabis, which is a uh, licensed producer in Stratford, Ontario, and um, we basically buy from uh, Green Seal in bulk, just like we buy from Supreme in bulk, and then we package uh, into containers. Uh, we get a QA to sign off on it and do the certificate of analysis on, on our side, and the lab tests are done, and then uh, and we put it into pre-rolls as well, and we ship that out. And these pre-rolls have been very popular. We're uh, hearing very strong results in the first few days in BC of uh, retailers uh, buying a good amount of our inventory uh, sure. in, in the first week. So really. It's, it's quite exciting. Um, we do have a small uh, grow ourselves, uh, but 95% of what we sell is grown by others. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, you know similar to uh, uh, Valens and Metafarms, uh, but we're different because we have a brand. So we're really much focused on building mm. our Blisco brand. Okay, uh, so you yeah. you are first and foremost involved in extraction, as you say. Yes. And that's interesting. So you're you're a, a third model. So Balance Grow does yeah. this toll milling model, yes. so to speak, but they also have proprietary input, but I haven't heard of them adding that yet. Yeah. And then we've got Metafarm, who's strictly a buyer of external product that right. they then put into a product form. And you've got external partners from who you get feedstock and you create your own brand. That's right. That's where I went. Wow. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. We've yeah. got three of the same things here. The, may the best man win. Uh, yeah. No, we're, we're happy to uh, stay in our lane. We're very much focused on building our cannabis wellness brand, and we're very much focused on and uh, on getting this to market. And then, of course, vape pens uh, and the full extracts that are coming out with extracts, edibles, and, and topicals coming out uh, later right. this year. But extracts is going to be a focus for ours. Okay. So in the short term, do you see that this, you know, we've got new rules coming out, meaning that everybody can now make X. Uh, extracted products like edibles, beverages, yes. uh, vape pens, etc. Do you see that you're going to possibly face a competition for feedstock uh, because pricing is going to go up due to the shortages created by this huge new wave of demand coming from the edibles? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And um, there will be demand for product, but the reality is there's more licensed producers coming on board all the time. We get approached by uh, I'd say at least three licensed producers a month who want to sell to us. Uh, and as well, what we're starting to do now, James, is starting to uh, buying um, outdoor hemp, high CBD hemp that is grown outdoors uh, from industrial hemp farmers or licensed under the Cannabis Act. So we've, still, we've processed uh, our first run of that, and the certificate of analysis results from the lab have come back positive. So as we move to the outdoor cultivation phase uh, in regards to hemp, we're going to see things really change uh, on, on that front. And you know, you're never going to be able to um, compete with the quality of indoor grown cannabis uh, for medical purposes, for pain, and for high THC. Um, but on the CBD side, there is there uh, will be more, uh, a lot more uh, bio, a lot more feed coming online, or a lot more biomass coming online. So we're. Um, yeah, we're really, really blessed and excited to have our current partners and supply partners uh, with Supreme and Green Seal, and we're expanding that uh, that uh, slowly uh, and making sure that uh, it's done the right way and 
And uh, you need to be careful what you bring into your facility because uh, you don't want to bring in any contaminants. Sure. Yeah, and uh, you know, we are going through the European GMP uh, process right now. So there's five companies in Canada that have a, Euro a European GMP certified facility. We had uh, the Germans, two Germans on site uh, in late January for four days and they came and they visited our facility, they went to our lab, and as well we were you know, fortunate to have Health Canada come as observ observers because they wanted to learn about this GMP process, which is great. And uh, so that is a real um, a focus of ours as well as to build our, our brand internationally is just focus on Germany and, and Europe mm -hmm. to start. Uh, and so we're, 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 that's like, it's quite an extensive process, this uh, European sure. GMP certification, and we're going to get there yeah. this year. I'm not an expert on extraction, and I'm curious curious because um, it seems to me that a layperson's thinking, which yeah. this is, uh, if you're going to create an extracted concentrate yeah. from a plant, mm -hmm. then technically, theoretically, shouldn't that plant it not matter whether the plant is indoor or outdoor? Um, one thing that I do have to say, we spend a lot of time with our quality assurance team. We've got a team of four, soon to be five. And uh, one of the uh, concerns that we talk about with uh, outdoor farmers is basically birds flying over top and uh, excrement coming from the sky. So that's, uh, <laughs> that is, that's honestly what QA is concerned about. And then really? number two, they're concerned about being too close to another farm and things uh, blowing over, any sort of pesticides. And so mm -hmm. when you're an outdoor farmer, you, know, you, um, you want to be focused. If you're an outdoor, outdoor hemp or cannabis farmer, you want to be focused on land and soil that has grown hay and canola. Mm -hmm. And so because those, two uh, stocks, those two feeds, oh, those two crops, you don't require any pesticides. So uh, there's been other uh, folks that uh, we hear out there that have grown in, in pro that are growing hemp in properties where there's maybe different uh, crops other than that, maybe flowers, maybe whatever it might be. And there are some residual pesticide issues. So that's a very sensitive issue to us as we uh, not only subscribe to the Health Canada standards of good production practices, we're taking it one level higher with good, good manufacturing practices. So that so really spending a lot of time getting to know your suppliers and your partners is, is really key for us. Sure. Uh, so yeah. Those, so those, this those. whole sort of expectation by the investment community that mm -hmm. this wave of outdoor grown mm -hmm. hemp derived CBD mm -hmm. is going to undermine the viability of all of those very expensive ultra high tech indergrowth sounds mm -hmm. like it might be completely false. I think the, the truth is somewhere in the middle, uh, for mm. sure, um, because number one, there will be, some might say, high CBD uh, hemp grown outside, potentially high CBD cannabis grown over time. But if you want a really high quality uh, cannabis that has a higher THC or that good balance, the most controlled environments would be um, would be indoor. And for instance, for the German markets, I could not see at this early stage uh, that uh, the Germans would allow us to extract and export uh, hemp or cannabis grown outdoors. Mm -hmm. I mean, will time will tell, but I don't think I would want to go down that road with our German inspectors. They feel a lot more comfortable um, with indoor grown cannabis. And so sure. we had our, our friendly German inspectors and they hadn't been to it. They were, they were inspecting pharmaceutical facilities and they came to our facility and they're like, oh, this is our first cannabis facility. And, <laughs> and so then they said, oh, we're used to, uh, this is, how do you, we can need to check your service records going back three years uh, for your HVAC equipment. And we're like, we've only been in service. For, we've only been licensed for about 11 months when they were issued, when they were, when they came, not even that. Mm. So um, they're like, then we need to do more extensive research on your quality of your water. And we're, we're in Van just outside Vancouver, so we've got good quality water. Wow. And so the, the level of detail you go into, so with, with this European GMP and is, uh, certification is quite, is quite high. Mm -hmm. So we're very cautious, probably ought to only ever be indoor that we would be interested in extracting uh, and exporting under the uh, under the GMP model. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Damien, that's uh, that's incredible. I you've really actually educated me today, which uh, doesn't happen every day on this yeah, show, but no. uh, most days it does. <laughs> uh, let's leave it there for now. We'll yeah. come back to you soon. Congratulations you on your much. product rollout and everything. I'm going to look for Blisco, and I can't yeah. wait to try the product. Nice. Well, we're here with I'm here with Nafisa, our sales manager, and we're going to submit to Ontario right in the near future to get these oils in there. So we look forward to uh, bringing you some oils one day from Ontario. Perfect. Thanks so much, James. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Yeah. All right. Ed's back with a chart, but first, did you know we're on Twitter? Let's talk about Aurora. Recently, your financials, you've mm -hmm. more or less delivered Here on Here are the headlines moving markets today. If you're lucky to buy it uh, 
three days ago at 37 cents. And I you think it has a it. lot to do with uh, some of these smaller names so giving really recreational cannabis is here. It's yeah, it's quite dry. So I'm going to eliminate the stocky bits. Chemistry Technologies has joined us as a client. So I want you to bear in mind all that that means. A client is somebody who we have invited to uh, be one of our uh, portfolio of companies that we consider to be of uh, higher than average grade. And uh, so, but that does mean that we are investors in them and we take money from them to help them produce top quality media and distribute it to the universe. Um, so basically, we're not to be trusted. With that being said, Ed, have you been watching the stock performance of chemistry in the it's, last couple of days? You know what? It, uh, the, 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 yeah, well, we got a chart up here right now. Let's as well look at the chart. Picture, Whoa! Picture tells a thousand words. That looks words. like the stairway to heaven. The stairway to heaven. <laughs> no, you know, look, look, we've had a basing period here. Yes. Right there. Yeah. So, you know, you know, you, if you're in that period, you uh, Mm. What's going on? No, oh, I know, but look Not at that. Much. Look at that. And then all of a sudden, four days ago, yeah. look at this move. Yeah. And then, you know, every one of these moves, they got, they got a, it, it sells off, but it keeps going higher. It yeah. just. What day did they become our client? Uh, I think probably this day. <laughs> yeah, you're right. How about that? Or, or, or that was, fr I guess that was Friday. Yeah, no, uh, it's funny. So Ben, who, who writes all of our stuff, sent me an email saying, uh, I, I can't, uh, I, I'm having a hard time seeing the story here. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the story to me is so so self-evident in the, the people of this company. When you look at the history of what they've done, what they've accomplished so far, it's a premium opportunity in the United States in the, in the terms of like, this is, uh, this is what an organically growing multi-state operator looks like uh, at birth so to speak, yeah. Uh, starting in two states, but with the top brands in, in those states and with the, uh, with the people at every step of the way are people with a track record. And you know, part of having a, co a company like Chemistry as a client is that we can only uh, talk about publicly released, publicly uh, available information. So we're not, we're not telling you anything new here, but that's what I would say is go look at the look, go look at the management team, go look at the board of directors, and you'll understand why this uh, chart is starting to have the trajectory it is having. It looks to me, and again, I, I for, because it's on the CNE, the CSE, which is the Canadian Stock Exchange securities. Technically, the name is the Canadian yeah, Securities Exchange. Security stocks, You know, the funny bonds. thing, people don't know this about the CSE, but the CSE was formerly uh, the CDNX, yes. then the CSNX, then the over the counter. CNQ. Canadian over the counter. Yeah. Yeah. And so this, this is a market that's had an identity crisis for throughout its teenage years and has only now with the convergence of new management, investment by some of the bigger players in the industry and the cannabis industry's rise. All of this has catalyzed a solidification of the CSE's identity, which is now the cannabis stock exchange, the cannabis securities exchange. I'm just going to make the point, though. I don't think there's a lot of shares outstanding in this deal. In uh, chemistry? Yeah. No, there's not. It's a tight float. Yeah, tight as mouse is yeah, Tight. That's one of the things I like about it. Tight. 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 Yeah, so we disclosed that we were shareholders. We actually didn't get to be shareholders in this. Uh, we were trying to buy it. I was chasing it in the market. The thing just got away yeah. from me. And the one thing that we don't do is chase stocks that are on a tear. So it's like we're yeah. not actually shareholders yeah. yet. Right now, they're just a client. But... Uh, and I don't have any bids in because I'm just watching this thing go. Yeah, going just like, flying away. Ah. Fly, 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 Fifi. Yeah, Fifi, fo fum. Look at this uh, market, though. So, okay, that's chemistry. Um, in a couple minutes, we are going to talk to Charles Turk from the Nine Point Alternative Healthcare Fund. Ooh, I think I got it right that time. And we haven't talked to Charles in a while. But first, we're going to take a look at these here. Theoretically, I'm going to look at the cannabis indices. Uh, it, it's not guaranteed. Oh, in fact, it is guaranteed that that's not going to happen because I can see that my NDI is not even showing this. So as, uh, is, uh, is Charles wired up? 
Oh, okay. Well, get on it, will you? It's supposed to be two minutes. <laughs> Inter interestingly enough, the HMMJ, which I'm not saying is a is a suitable alternative suitable. to looking at the esteemed Midas letter indices. Oh, well. But, no, but the I mean, difference between the Midas letter indexes yeah. and the HMMJ is the HMMJ actually buys a lot more stock than we do. I think he said it was over a hundred billion dollars under management now. Is that how much? I think it's. Oh God, he told me and I can't remember. But well, yeah, uh, we'll J find J out. JWCA was a buck ten. It's now a buck eighteen. Buck I eighteen. That's because of our big mouths. Well, <laughs> one, one of us has a big mouth. Well. I'm not, I'm not saying which who, which, I'm not saying who. Boy, we could have some fun with that, but we're not going to. No. No, this we're not going to. This is a show about sexual innuendo. Duh. No. Duh. This is a show about cannabis. I like, I like. Ed, I what's happened to you? What's happening? You're, Watch. You're going down. Going down now. Going down. Okay, okay so, so the marijuana sector. Ooh. There's, there continues to sh flash, uh, Brilliance and also flash some mediocrity, but but there's definitely some are really flying. Yeah. Some are flying a little, yeah. and some are eh, eh, not flying. Not flying. And MedMen's not flying, for instance. MedMen's not flying. Yeah. Market's closed. Market's closed, so we can't. Oh well, no wonder it's not flying. It's not. <laughs> it's not flying. You know what? I mean, if you're a cannabis entrepreneur, here's the mistake that MedMen made. And I'm going to say this, and then you watch. MedMen's going to take off to 30 bucks or something, make me look like a complete twat. But yeah, maybe uh, MedMen's yeah. mistake was that their CEO, Adam Bierman, is a bit of a cocky individual. And he, first of all, the biggest expression of a cocky individual in form of management is when they come up with this super voting structure, which there's a few of these around now. And typically, we're not big fans of those N because. Nobody likes those things because they make you. It, make, it makes the investor think, hey, wait a minute, are you special? Yeah. You're special. Well, you get a salary for being special. Right. But now you get more votes for being special. Right. And you, while you're special, I'm actually Funding below it. inferior of the average because yeah. I can't be trusted to vote properly. You know what? Trudeau should get on one of these special. I think Trudeau's trying to turn Canada into a special voting yeah, structure. Yeah, no, no. There you go. Trudeau? Yeah. Trudeau? Uh, nope. Okay, I take it Ain't back. Happening. I get it now. That's right. We have what you, you call... You want to come back as a marijuana CEO. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, no. it. He's trying to get out of a job. He's like watching all this, oh. this, uh, you not know, all, this CEO not, and enrichment. I say not all CEOs, but multi-voting no. CEOs. The guys making the biggest money are not officers or directors of any company. Nor are they on any Forbes list. And no, 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 nobody can do the boogaloo like I do. All right, so today is a special day, a very special day, because I share a five-year anniversary today with one of the oh, not one of the first cannabis company to become publicly traded on the planet in the current regime. And I'm talking about Canopy Growth. Five years ago today, Canopy Growth went public uh, with a market cap of $35 million. Five years ago today, I published my sixth marijuana podcast with Bruce Linton as my guest. And this was back in the day when the Globe and Mail wouldn't talk to no cannabis company CEO. Back then, you know how many publicly traded cannabis companies there were? Seven. One. One. Seven. That's the first one. So obviously there was only one. Oh, and if you were talking to them, how could anybody else talk to them? Well, everybody could have talked to them. No, they couldn't because you were talk talking to them. I wasn't talking to them. You know what? And it wasn't with Bruce Linton I had the interview. That was when Chuck Rafici was the CEO or was and he Chuck the CEO? And Chuck moved on to XLY. Chuck went on to Cannabis Wheaton, which became Oxley. That is correct. You know, interestingly, Chuck was the CFO of the uh, Liberal Party of Canada. Uh, during their election run. Well, there you go. Now, here's a question. Chuck is the CFO of the Liberal Party of Canada. Do you think he would have had some advanced knowledge that maybe these licenses were coming down the pike? And more to my point, I wonder who the first investors were in that round. Mm, controversial. Mm. Speculative. Mm. No, but very dramatic, and I'm absolutely, I have no idea what I'm talking about. 
Okay, so today is a special day. It's Canopy Growth's five-year anniversary of being a public company. This is a company that has taken a $35 million market cap and morphed it into $20 billion in market cap in five short years. That is an accomplishment of biblical proportions. And there, I just read the throw again. What do you want? In 2014, Tweed Inc. was founded by Bruce Linton and Chuck Rafiki. In September 2015, the company was renamed Canopy Growth Corporation. In October 2015, they announced a partnership with DNA Genetics, and in February 2016, they struck a deal with rapper Snoop Dogg. In November 2016, Canopy Growth became the first cannabis company to achieve the $1 billion unicorn status. In March 2017, they were added to the TSX, on October 2017, Constellation Brands announced they were investing $245 million into the company. In May 2018, Canopy Growth listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And in August of that same year, Constellation Brands invested an additional $5 billion in the company. In October 2018, the company's market capitalization exceeded $14 billion US dollars. And that month, CEO Bruce Linton sold the first legal gram of cannabis in Canada. And in February 2019, the company hit a record net revenue of $83 million for Q3 2019. Today is a special day because Charles Turk is here. Charles is the CEO, or sorry, you're one of the co-CEOs of the Nine Point Alternative Health Fund. It's, it's a mouthful. Yes. Uh, Faircourt is the portfolio advisor to the okay. Nine Point Alternative Health Fund. Whoa. And uh, I guess we're, again already. we are also <laughs> celebrating uh, uh, an anniversary around really? this time. Yeah, it was two years ago that mm -hmm. we launched our mutual fund. Wow. Uh, so we are the first actively managed mutual fund in the country that has a focus in the cannabis industry. So Congratulations. I'm glad that we're sharing something with uh, yeah. Bruce Linton. It's just a day of anniversary. It is. It's a good is. thing these all didn't happen on April 1st. Oh, it would be like yeah. nobody would believe a word we said. So, uh, Charles, it's been, I can't remember, when is the last time we talked to you? It's been a few months. Uh, yeah, uh, easily January, maybe even December. Yeah, okay. it's been a while. Why don't, you, why don't we start with an update of the fund itself and how it's performing? Yeah, it's... Uh, Gangbusters, you know, wow. it, the, it's funny because we, we uh, Q4 was horrible for everybody in all asset classes, equity markets uh, generally sold off. And uh, we got into the new year and quickly the cannabis sector took off and more so the Canadian names than the US names. And what was interesting about that, the reason I bring it up, is that we wrote a uh, commentary, our forecast for 2019 in November and December, and we said, we believe that 2019 is the year of U.S. expansion. We're going to orient more of our portfolio towards U.S. names. And uh, right now, um, about 60% of our can cannabis exposure is in U.S. names. Hmm. And that's really a big change and very different from most, if not all, of the other cannabis funds in the country where they have smatterings of, of U.S. cannabis names. We believe, as we've seen with uh, the regulatory out, um, uh, Health Canada came out with their information on first quarter usage and sales and they found that although there's demand, still aren't enough stores in Canada, uh, still shelves are empty and whether it's logistics or lack of supply, there's a problem. So it means that on a quarterly basis for the foreseeable future, the Canadian companies are going to lag, whereas there's a lot of positive catalysts south on the border. Case in point, the farm bill which came in in, uh, in December, which really catapulted the U.S. market ahead of Canada because they now separated hemp-derived CBD from cannabis-derived CBD. Mm -hmm. and so now you can get CBD in the mass market, or is what is about to happen right. uh, mass market-wise. So, so bigger opportunities, we believe, south of the border. Yeah. Does the uh, advent of the various legislation and the recognition, or at least the categorization of uh, CBD derived from the cannabis sativa plant with a proportion of THC below 0.3 percent yeah. uh, versus the cannabis sativa plant with a proportion of THC higher than 0.3 percent. I mean that's a very arbitrary and esoteric definition and I guess it's related to well below 
3% THC, there's well, zero and, risk of psychotropism. Yeah, and, and, and what the FDA is trying to enforce is we don't want any THC getting into the mass market. Hmm. And so if it is guaranteed that it's hemp-derived CBD, right. then it's going to fall within uh, an easier regulatory framework. And right now, not only that, but they're working on language. So they want to make sure that nobody is taking advantage of the opportunity and making false claims. And they definitely and, don't want to take a chance then of THC getting into the broad correct. market because not like the safe, much safer fentanyl, which is widely no, no, available no, well, on the street. Yeah, we, we, we're not going to get into the <laughs> ethics or morals here. I couldn't resist here. that. I couldn't no, no, resist no, of course. That. But, but so, so what, what they're doing mm. is they're making sure that, you know, first we've got uh, CVS and Walgreens who have said that they're going to allow topicals and creams um, into their stores, and that was a huge boost. And so, you know, as we said at the beginning of the year, focus in the U.S., you've seen in February and March the U.S. names have really uh, sur surpassed mm -hmm. uh, Canadian performance, and the Canadian so? names have, um, well, just in terms of market cap and growth. Appreciation and um, share price. Yeah, ab absolutely. The oh, appreciation okay. of the U.S. companies sure. in the last two months yeah. has been significant, whereas Relative to the, Canadian the Canadian names where January was the month. Right. Case in point, I actually, you should have done this with Ed last time, because in the last segment with his technicals, if you look at Canopy, um, in the first month of the year, it just went rocket. It's straight up. But from the maybe first week of February to now, it's relatively flat. So if you invested early in January, it went up, that's terrific. But the rest of the time in the, in the first quarter, it was pretty flat. Whereas you take a look at the U.S. names, they've all continued to grow. And if you take a look at one Canadian name specifically, talking about Village Farms, where got a listing on NASDAQ, which made it U.S. eligible, mm -hmm. but it's, it's um, Texas farm and its ability to be involved in the hemp industry had it take off. Right. And year to date, it's up 320%. Wow. So the focus on the U.S. is, you know, near term, the, the addressable market is significant. The catalysts, the positive catalysts, reduced regulatory burden, states going rec that are previously medical, um, and then you're taking a look at the M&A opportunity that has also been you know, very positive for investors. Right. Um, I'm curious as to from where you sit. So there's a global pool of capital, yeah. and we're at a point right now where the, the number of people coming to the cannabis uh, industry from the global pool of capital is still rising. Yes. And so the available capital to the cannabis industry is still rising. Yes. But at some point, there's going to be a uh, rebalancing of the available capital because too much capital is going to come into the space and cause a revaluation of the entire sector to the downside. We know this because this is what happens every time yeah. an industry expands rapidly due to some fundamental shift in either legislation, demand, desire, whatever. Yeah. Um, do you think, how close do you think we are to that inflection point? I, I don't think we're close. Not um, even. Not because there isn't demand. Right. Um, we have been actively searching on the institutional side to see where um, other fund companies are, to see where pension funds are. Um, and by and large, they're looking at the sector. They're either interested but unsure, or they're against it for some reason. Like they'll own Raytheon and other mm -hmm. surface-to-air missile manufacturers, but they don't want to own cannabis names. Mm -hmm. And then, again, the moral right. discussions they can have. but. Um, uh, but many long only traditional institutional names are still not in the sector. I think a lot of it has to do with they're behind in terms of making the valuations work for them, understanding the regulatory environment, and just not knowing the difference between Canopy and Aurora. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, you've got a few groups that have been in the sector for a while and, and 
there isn't widely distributed information. So here, here's my pitch, right. which is why you want to own an actively managed mutual fund. We, <laughs> oh, that was yeah, good. So I'm coming. <laughs> no, but it, it's true. You know, the, the more we, uh, the more we meet with people, whether they're institutionally managing money or on the re retail side, uh, they don't have the database of knowledge. We see deals every day mm -hmm. uh, from around the world, and we're able to go through both private and public deals and, and opportunities and see where there's value, where there's mispriced opportunity. And so we have a good database of knowledge. I'm mm -hmm. not saying we're the smartest. I am saying that we are the hardest working. This is your and second year anniversary. We're doing it every day, yeah. Right. And so, you know, year to date, our fund is up uh, 35, 36%. And um, as we just celebrated our two years, we have more than doubled investors' money in two years on a fund. Mm -hmm. So. That and that's, doesn't happen every and day. That's, and that's still holding cash. Wow. So we still have over 10% in cash. Wow. So looking well, for more opportunities. congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you give our, uh, our hungry audience yes. a couple of ideas as, in terms of names that might be so far still under the radar that you've got your position wow. in, so you're not still chasing yeah. it that you'd be willing to talk about? Um, well, look, uh, yeah, these are all uh, widely known. Uh, we still believe... We have shortened our bench when it comes to the Canadian names, mm -hmm. and I think we made that so clear earlier. So is that to earlier. say there are no more opportunities in Canada? No, it's not that there aren't any opportunities, but I think you've got to look very carefully at the new entrants, at the smaller entrants. I really think there's a, a bifurcation in the market between the haves, those that have capital or access to capital, and the have-nots. You know, we saw a great example of this a month ago with Hexo buying New Strike. New Strike. Uh, to us was, although it was a little bit forgotten, it needed a little marketing and it probably could have got, um, you know, restarted and, you know, and had its relationship with the Tragically Hip. It um, was getting into branding through a relationship it had with Neil Brothers. Uh, it's got four indoor facilities and yet they believed, they, management and the board, believed that it would have been better to team up with, with Hexo. Mm -hmm. And so Hexo is well capitalized, nothing wrong with that. But it's just surprising that here's a company that had all that going for them, as well as about $100 million on their balance sheet, and they decided that the uphill battle was too much to bear. So I'm of the opinion that we have enough in terms of large Canadian LPs. We are only 37 million people. The growth in this sector is going to be those that focus internationally. And I think, um, you know, going back to Bruce, uh, Bruce Linton has said often that the capital that he has from Constellation is not going to be for M&A activity in Canada. It's for global opportunities. Right. And so you're seeing that with the M&A opportunities south of the border, where you're seeing uh, regional MSOs move into big treasure markets like California. Re this week we saw. Cresco buying Origin House, the right. former Canada Royalty, right. which is the big prize. California is larger than Canada, and um, Origin House is in about 500 dispensaries. This was a this was a jewel for any other multi-state operator because they can't start from the ground up in California. Right, that's so, the price tag. That's the price tag, and so yeah. this well, is the great, largest. Well played by Mark Lustig and team. Eh? Very what well, and I, I texted him. Uh, the night after it happened and just said, you know, well done. Yeah. If if anyone offered me that price on my stock today, <laughs> good for you. Yeah, you yeah. bet. Okay, so the Canada market is not so attractive. The U.S. market, the multi-state operator, is 60% of your book. What about the international plays like Chiron and Columbia? Chiron's yeah. our client by way of disclosure, so sure. I just want to make sure that's known. But there's Chiron sort of has the lead in the in the whole Latin American opportunity, but there's now a whole bunch of others. Yeah. Does the fact that there's others out there attract you? Uh, does the international play attract oh, you at this point, or absolutely. is it still a little early yet? No, um, actually, we're looking at um, uh, we're looking at at South America, Latin America for sure. Uh, Chiron, Pharmacielo, um, a few others that are that have a focus as cultivation in in uh, South America and then distribution globally um, haven't yet made an investment. Mm -hmm. uh, partly because of valuation, partly because I think the companies are still a little early. You know, when you're they're 
they're regulated, they have their license, but cultivation is early on. And um, I know Chiron has made some, uh, some inroads with Mexico, which is great. Um, so it's still just a little early. We are looking at uh, European companies. The hemp-derived CBD market in Europe is thriving, mm -hmm. and you're gonna see more and more of those types of companies coming, and we're taking a look at those. Uh, you're seeing a lot of Israeli companies now, now that Israel is allowed to export, uh, you're seeing those. So, uh, you know, one of the thesis that we had originally was ultimately cultivation is gonna be done in countries that are probably more competitive to Canada for the global market. So yeah, absolutely, we're, we're taking a look at them, um, more so on the private side than the public side. Cool. So to get in early. All right, Charles, uh, that's, as usual, a very uh, enlightening update. I'm so grateful for your participation. Yeah, I wish sorry, I saw you more often. it's been a long time. Yeah, yeah, no, we'll, we'll uh, try and make a date soon. All right, thanks for joining me. All right, coming up next, we're going to have a chat with uh, Rob Hill. He's the CFO of Emerald Health Therapeutics, and you can take a look at this little sampler first. Emerald Health Therapeutics, Inc. is a Canadian licensed producer of cannabis with indoor cultivation facilities in BC and Quebec. The company is focused on developing proprietary cannabis products for medical and adult use customers. Emerald is part of the Emerald Health Group, which represents a group of companies focused on developing pharmaceutical, botanical, and nutraceutical products to provide wellness and medical benefits by interacting with the human body's endocannabinoid system. Emerald Health Therapeutics trades on the TSX Venture under the ticker symbol EMH. Hang out for 10 minutes and you can. Okay. I'll, I'll show you. Okay. Okay. We're, uh... Hey, we've everybody. Lost, we've lost the call. Oh, that's excellent. Let me get deep. So uh, we're talking to each other. How do we do that? Look, through the, the operator, the, operator. The miracle of modern technology. Give me a line. I got a bad case of losing you. Well, we're in the last 10 minutes of the show. Anyways, hey, got any more news yet? You see any more charts? What do you got for charts? I got no charts. You got no charts. No, you got no device. I got no device. You were cast onto the set without any warning. No, so it's going to have to be one-liners back and forth Deus for 10 minutes. Ex, it's not machina, it's machina, apparently. Deus ex machina. Who told you that? I, 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 I Googled it. And how did you know that the pronunciation, because the spelling's the same. They said, they, they said, they said it, machina. And how do you know that they were right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know they're right, but that's what they're saying. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why would you say machina and then machina? I don't know. It's yeah. kind of Machiavellian. In a weird kind of yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, so I've been doing battle here with oh, the uh, okay, NDI. Okay. Yeah. You take delivery of your computer. And I take I'm delivery. Going to, uh, let's take a look at the S&P today. You want, yeah, let's pull up the S&P. Let's not look While at the... While you do that, S I'm going to pull up the audience and let's see what's going on Let's not look at the S and poop. Let's look at the S&P. S-N-P. Get it? Got it. All right. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'll tell you, that's the Coming one place I went to that I really would like to go back to. Where? S&P? Peru. Peru. Oh, yeah. Well, Lima. We could be going back there many times Lima this beans. year. I like to get some Lima beans. Lima. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, oh, boy. Okay, so the, the, the hey, we got a, a oh. neutral day, another neutral day. We got two neutral days in a row here. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. Neutral. Neutral. So what's the uh, what's the word, Ed? Well, it's it's, it's like, like it's, a bit of a it, it, like you know what I'm going to consolidation. Gonna, here, let me just put this up. Equilibrium. Yeah, let's let's look at some equilibrium. hallucination, intoxication, discombobulation. Why why don't you? Do, okay, there we go. What's going on over there? Okay, so you having a Microsoft moment? So look at this. We got we got two candles that are Doji candles back to back, which which implies indecision. Yes. That doesn't mean we can't keep going up. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the market just feels like it just seems to be grinding a little bit higher. I, I know there's some issues that are down. You know, Boeing, with all the shit it's gone through, Boeing's had a pretty good run off the bottom. Yeah, Boeing. Boeing. Well, you know, it had to happen, because here's the bottom line. Everybody knows they're going to fix that plane. Yeah, but would you feel comfortable getting on that plane? Well, uh, and I'll bet you dollars to donuts it gets a name change here pretty quick. 
<laughs> wow. Because that way you'll be like, oh, have you been on the have you been on the repaired 737 Max 8? You'll be like, no, but I've been on the net brand new 737 discombobulated Dreamliner. Yeah. And it'll be like, oh yeah, that plane's good. It reminds me of the 737 MAX yeah. 8. In fact, it has the exact same layout, but it's not called that, so it's a different plane. It's a different plane, yeah. Right. Well, we're, so, we're, we're such suckers for that, us human beings. Suckers. Yeah, uh, interesting note here from Joseph Lee, one of our regular viewers. Hello, Joseph, and thank you for this little tidbit. He says that uh, given a, uh, MedMen Enterprises has been given a $9 price target on the U.S. listing, which is MMNFF, uh, by Northland Securities analysts three days ago. So pull up a MedMen chart, Ed. Let's see how let's that prediction is looking right now. Well, I tell you, that, that issue was flying today. That's a, is that U.S.? Yeah. Well, M-N-N-F, M-N-N-F-F is the U.S. symbol for oh, yeah. M. M E N, which is the CSX. C. Yeah. How come the all these deals will trade in Canada? And not. Look at this. Three ninety five oh, well, down a nickel. Is that the F symbol? No, that's the Canadian. Okay, so there but, you but have it. But that's. I mean, look. It, it's what has it done in the last little while? It's done nothing. Yeah. It's in the last since uh, beginning of December. I'm just going to... Wow, so it hasn't participated in the downdraft. It hasn't participated in the updraft. So th here we go. Here, this takes us back to December. We're going to have okay. to get him tomorrow. See that? Yeah. See that? That's that's what you call predictable. Yes. Equilibrium. Equilibrium. Yeah. So I, you know what? Now, which way it breaks from there is probably where you want to be. If, if, it, if it, for some reason, this thing starts to go up in big volume, it gets through this... That, now that line's arbitrary. I drew it in there. There's a line there somewhere. It gets through. Go long. If it if you lo if you're long and this thing breaks down from here, I'd say, lighten up. Right. Okay. So it breaks the top line there, or the average. Yeah. Which is four. What is that? Four sixty. You know, four sixty. Yeah. So four sixty. Four sixty. It's going harder, higher, higher, harder. Higher, faster, yeah, yeah, longer. Yeah, yeah, look now look at here. It it there was a little bit of a that app that yeah. happening. And then it broke through. Right. And then you know, a couple months later, it's almost ten bucks. <laughs> there you go. Jeez. Here, watch this. I'll show you a little. Well, this is the thing, you know, if you uh, There you go. Now what do you got? Yeah, look at that. See? Humpty Dumpty. There you go. Humpty How Dumpty sat on a wall. How about this? Whoa. How about that's my eyeball. How That's about hilarious. That? That's fantastic, Ed. Okay, okay, this is an art class. Okay. Damn you, Ed. Okay. Um, so, uh, Till the, Ray, one thing Till I want to okay, talk ahead. about, remember we were talking about the uh, the issue with uh, the the publication of some uh, negative press from Chiron yesterday? Chiron was uh, up a tad today. Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, get let's this. So the, I got a note from a guy named Gustavo Avendano, Avendano who uh, is uh, obviously a native Spanish speaker. Uh, and he gave me an absolute translation of the, of the government that was published by the Mexican document. And he says that uh, COFAPRIS, which is the agency, the Mexican Health Canada, did revoke regulations issued in 2018 because they didn't follow appropriate enactment procedures. So this was a government thing that was revoked. There are no companies under investigation. That is 100% false reporting by whatever outlets reported that. What they're doing is they're saying, oops, we screwed up, we're pulling the licenses, we'll be back to you when we've got the right things. And okay. he makes and much ado about nothing. Well, Gustavo makes a good point. He says, well, the Canadians screwed up their licensing process at first, as have half of the states. And so why would you think that Mexico wouldn't also have the same growing pains, which I think is an excellent point. So, and also he says, and I, I'm sorry to say that all my ideas are coming from Gustavo today, but uh, I mean, he's, he's thinking the same way I, I'd like to think I would have. But he says, the only question is, how long is it going to take for them to fix the problems? And, uh, you know, that's, that's an interesting thing. It could happen in months. Uh, he points out that having Vicente Fox on the board of Chiron is a plus in this case, and will probably be directly correlated to some expedition of the uh, issue at hand or yeah. the rectification of the problem. So I just wanted to say thank you to Gustavo Avendano. He's the founder and CEO of Growing Herbs Corp. Uh, you can check them out at growingherbscorp.com. Um, we are not going to talk to uh, Rob Hill, the CFO of uh, Emerald Health, 
because we have run out of time. He is going to join us tomorrow now. And uh, tomorrow, who else have we got tomorrow? Let's take a look at what's coming up tomorrow. You're going to be here. David Kadekel's on tomorrow. I'm okay. going to be here. You're, I'm going to be here. You're going to be here? Yeah. And, oh, Anthony Durkatch is back. Now, you remember Anthony Durkatch was uh, here I, recently for yeah, yeah. FSD Pharma. Now he's coming back now for... Now he's coming back for Worldwide Extracts, in which I'm a shareholder. Pump. Pump. P-U-M-P. Yes, we love the symbol. We love the symbol. Uh, anyways, so yeah, that's going to be an interesting conversation. Um, you, know, you, you know, a point to make here on the on the can trust. I, I again, I'm you know paraphrasing. Look, look, they came up with bad results, mm -hmm. and they're getting punished for it. The stock's under ten bucks now. Nine ninety six yeah. continues yeah. to go lower. Yeah, it was thirteen and change. Now mm -hmm. nine. Third of the value is gone. Third. Really. Third. A turd. A turdy tree and a turd? Turdy tree and a turd percent. Economic percent. Economic and growth. Economic growth in the country. Economic growth. Boy, look at uh, JWCA closed up 13 cents on the day, dollar eighteen. Do you know what? Not a shareholder, but they are a former client, and uh, I have it on good authority, my own, that their new growth storm system, this aeroponic system, is going to revolutionize the yield of cannabis plants on a per cubic uh, foot basis because uh, it's basically... Damn, you see that? This stuff, it makes cannabis grow so fast you can watch it growing. Now, why would I say that if I didn't own Maybe the stock and they were not a client? Bamboo. Because it's true. Maybe it's bamboo grass. Well, you know, it's interesting. When you look at a cannabis stock that's been growing in their aeroponic system, you're looking at it, it's like, that doesn't look like cannabis because it's pure green, the stock. There's absolutely, like, none of the... None of the external patina that you see on a traditionally grown cannabis stock, even in a hydroponic system, it's just it's just replicating that exterior so fast that it looks fresh every day. It looks like it just sprouted out, and but they're like this after a month. Tremendous, tremendous. We're going to be we're going to be going and visiting uh, JWC's expansion project with cameramen in tow soon enough, and. Uh, that's it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to submit your questions to Midas Letter at Midas Letter. Hit the little like sign, the subscribe sign. Tell your friends. Tell your mother. Put it in your will. Put us in your will, and we'll see you tomorrow.